Uh, epic job, Marwa and Ibrahim. I just wanted to say that it's a real hard act to follow, but uh, I'll do my best. And um, yeah, I wanted to discuss a bit more. Um, I think one of the biggest challenges for all of us in this field is, is psychoeducation itself and almost kind of breaking through the taboo with our community around um, why this is a beneficial and helpful field. I mean, I always tell Muslims we study more and more about less and less. You know, we have about three main tracks that we all go into, generally engineering, medicine, and something uh, else in tech. Um, so we're learning more and more about less and less, and meanwhile we're losing the, uh, the depth of understanding the social and human sciences, which is something that, as we learn today, um, in our history has been uh, a big part of our civilization. So I just wanted to do a quick um, kind of reflection on one of the things that I share with the community, <clears throat> and maybe this could be helpful for everyone listening as well as um, our practitioners, is that I often sometimes say that the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu himself was uh, a psychologist. And the reason why I say that is because if you look at the phases of his mission, um, they are in many ways parallel or, or symbolic, if you will, of the counseling or therapeutic treatment process. You got it. Okay, great. So just a few slides here um, to kind of uh, guide us. Um, first off, we all are familiar with this uh, taboo, and I think that it is also connected to, um, let's say, three points that I want to share here. The first one is uh, Muslim cultures, as we know, are what anthropology would call shame-based culture. Um, we have a very strong emphasis on external standards of judgment and uh, evaluation. In other words, you know, what will people say, what will people think? Um, we need to have uh, a certain uh, social status or reputation to uphold. And, you know, going to a therapist, going to a counselor um, kind of takes away from that sense of dignity and honor that many Muslim families uh, work very hard to maintain and keep. The second reason I believe that it, we have this taboo towards uh, psychology as a community is of course, the idea that psychology is rooted in Western paradigms, as Brother Ibrahim also uh, shared with us, and, and more importantly, this idea that psychology is a new science or field that emerged in the early 1900s. And, of course, the first thing anyone says to me when I say I'm a psychologist, they say, oh, Sigmund Freud, or can you read my mind? <laughs> and I say, no, I can't read your mind, but I can interpret your behaviors and get a good sense of what your mind's thinking. Um, but this idea of psychology is, you know, comes from Sigmund Freud and there's all these, you know, weird complexes that many Muslims kind of dismiss without understanding what it's all about. Um, I, of course, try to bring uh, the education around the history of Islamic sciences and um, how we do have a concept of ilm al-nafs or the science of the self and, of course, ulum al-ihsan and tasawwuf are uh, wonderful frameworks that you know our scholars and masters uh, throughout our history have provided for human development, um, spiritual and mental purification, as well as growth. Uh, so, so this is something that I feel like many Muslims we don't even know our history, and this is part of the process of psychoeducation and deconstructing uh, the taboo. The last um, point that I find pretty common is this idea that hey, Islam's a way of life, there's no need for counseling or therapy, um, we've got everything we need uh, in Islam. And, you know, I call this the Islam is all we need syndrome. <laughs> and this idea is basically flawed because, again, if we know our history, we recognize that, you know, all of the sciences that the Muslim civilization excelled in um, often they were already grounded in other cultures and other civilizations. And what we did as Muslims is we took that in and then re-expressed it through the lens of Tawheed. Um, so this is, this is not something that uh, was uncommon in our, uh, our, our, our history to begin with. Um, the, other, the other aspect of that is when it comes to any other science or any other need or support that the human being uh, seeks, 
whether it's uh, medical support or um, engineering support, we never say Islam is enough, right? If, if I have something, uh, an ailment in my body, we will go to a doctor. No one's going to say, well, just pray, brother, and inshallah your cancer will go away. We, know, we always supplement prayer with actual medical diagnosis and treatment. Um, if we need to build a bridge, we do get civil planners and engineers to construct it. We don't get the local imam to, to try to build a bridge for us. So this idea of, you know, Islam is the only thing that we need, uh, I think can also be detrimental if it's not balanced and, of course, um, uh, rooted with, with reason as well. So often I'll have clients who even come to me, they'll say, you know, brother, I went to several imams before, and, you know, I had all these issues, and they would say things like, just pray more, or they would quote a hadith or Quran, and then expect that that's supposed to, you know, change my life. And this isn't to take away, of course, from the roles of our imams and uh, the roles of uh, religion and prayer, etc. But I think that we need to kind of um, recalibrate this understanding, um, because an imam in Arabic just means a leader. It just means somebody that you follow. So there's imams in every field, in every science, in every subject, if you will. So one example of this that I'd like to kind of help us uh, understand in application is this idea of we know that you have to uh, be good to your wives. You know, often um, the Prophet I sent him, is quoted, and you know, I'm the best to uh, the best of you are those who are best to your wives, and I'm the best to my wives. Okay, wonderful. So if, if my uh, wife, for example, or, or even husband, uh, let's just take it as a partner in a marriage, um, they are giving, uh, there's, a, there's a lot of aggression and criticism and maybe even violence. And you go to an imam and they just say, hey, you should be good to your wife because it's following the prophet. Um, that's great, but at the same time, how do I actually apply this in practice? Um, and what if I go home and I and I say the hadith or I tell my wife or husband that this is how it's got to be, you got to follow the sunnah, but it's just not working. What do you do next? Uh, and this is where I think the power of counseling and therapy and, and these professional health fields really come into play because there's always so much more to the individual story than simply just sharing um, a piece of advice or a quote. Oftentimes there are deeper reasons behind why this individual has certain character traits, whether it be trauma or negative experiences in the past um, or uh, um, other types of pain that were caused within the relationship itself. So these are things that oftentimes we overlook uh, in light of Islam is all we need syndrome. The next thing I'd like to share here is this idea of the beautiful analogy that we could extract from the prophetic uh, phases in his mission, وسلم, and what we might call the psychology process. And so quickly here, the first thing that we know about the prophetic mission is that the Prophet وسلم, by his nature, he was an amin and he was a seeker of light. And especially in the dark times of his society, he used to often go and reflect and ask himself questions. Uh, about how things can change and why things are so dark. And oftentimes the client will reach out to a professional helper uh, when they begin to recognize they really need help and that they're in dark times in their life. And so there's this type of reflection as well as acceptance around being humble and recognizing that sometimes you need support to get through the challenges that you face. The second phase that you find in the prophetic uh, mission is that the Prophet ﷺ first started to identify incorrect beliefs and, uh, and false beliefs. Uh, this was happening before he became a prophet as well as at the beginning of becoming a prophet. We know that the majority of wahi that came down, it was all about iman and aqidah and constructing a, a proper belief system. And similarly, in the psychology process, we begin with the counseling uh, or therapy as learning the personal story of the client and helping the client gain self-awareness and realize their personal issues. In other words, coming to terms with what kind of beliefs uh, have been held and constructed over the years and how that's influencing their moods and behaviors. Uh, another uh, concept uh, in, in, in the field is, is CBT or Cognitive Behavioral Therapy. This, the next phase that we find with the Prophet وسلم, is this idea of uh, identifying now the social ills and the individual diseases that are a result of the incorrect uh, beliefs. 
and of course challenging the power structure itself, the society itself, because the society is often the first system which allows these beliefs and social diseases to continue by practicing them blindly through tradition as we know the Quran ridicules this approach of we do what our forefathers do and this is even something that Muslims do today they inherit their Muslim traditions or certain understandings and they say I'm not gonna challenge that because that's what my forefathers did and we're gonna follow what our forefathers did even if they're Muslim and even if they're wrong so this is also something that I've recognized in, in, in working with uh, the Muslim community. It even applies to us. And in the psychology process, we have to recognize these behaviors and challenge our own stories and challenge our own traditions and cultures, even if they are Muslim, because it's not enough to say, well, if my parents are Muslim, I just do what they say. We still need to have a sincere, introspective process. And the last two points here is this idea that the Prophet ﷺ during his da'wah um, would address individuals and tribes based on their backgrounds. So this kind of reflects this idea of every client has a unique story and case-by-case -case action plan and treatments are tailored for the specific needs of the person or the couple or the family. And last point that I think is very profound is one of the powers of, of religion in general is this idea of having ultimate accountability before the divine, before Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And we as therapists and counselors, we provide a wonderful safe space for people to hold themselves accountable through our feedback and our professional observations. And the consistency itself allows the self to go through accountability. Lastly, the Prophet Sallallahu used to check up on his community. He used to ask about people when they weren't around and make sure that information was shared. And so as helpers, we also are checking in with these individuals and families that we are trying to work with and hope that they improve their lives um, weekly or monthly, etc. And oftentimes we, we keep um, checking in with our uh, clients to ensure this uh, success. So my last uh, point here that I'd like to share is I like to see Islamic psychology as Islam itself as a is a path to the divine. And this, of course, includes, you know, beliefs, character, worship, and social transactions, what we might call the universals. So, you know, all three of us here, um, and probably most of the people listening, they are Muslim, and we share a lot of universals. Like, we have basic tenets that we all agree to and rituals that we practice. However, I like to see Islamic psychology as the individual journey on that path to the divine. And so everyone is different, and we're going to face unique challenges provided who we are in our character and our personal context and this is more about the particulars and this is why I don't believe we all need to be the same or act the same as Muslims we already share the universals and that gives us the common ground but in the end of the day we all have to find our uh, individual purpose and meaning and how to serve Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and sometimes uh, this is overlooked um, because we believe we all have to you know feel and act a certain way because we all share the same Islamic tradition.